Assalamualaikum everyone. Can you hear me clearly? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So, how are you all today? How are the post leaves going on? Alhamdulillah, ma'am. Alhamdulillah. How are the Ramzan going on? It's good. Good? Yes. Har cheez ka ek good points and downside hoti hai. Downside is that we are not meeting in person. We are not having interactive classes. Chukhe ek class ka ek or ek there is a different type sort of an environment when we are in the lecture hall. But at the same time, it's giving you the opportunity to stay at home and uh, in Ramadan. Anyways, I hope we can, uh, this passes off quickly and we can get together and have a session face to face. Today, Ma'am, when are we going to have campus sessions again? Abita, Abitak, uh, we haven't been intimidated about any of this. Because when the government orders me, our classes renew or restart until then we have to be online. But and what about, is... what about our college? We heard there's a lot of corona and spreading and stuff. I think it is as much as uh, in any other uh, place because uh, definitely we are seeing lots of patients uh, in the hospital. So uh, asymptomatic patients who are not carrying uh, any signs and symptoms they are difficult to identify. And uh, if your uh, fever check is negative, hai, your antigen testing is also negative, and you clear those two, um, the uh, initial assessments, and you walk into the hospital, but still you are carrying the organism. So there is no... Uh, uh, there are no... Uh, there are no indicators that this person is an asymptomatic patient. And although every person who is examining these patients is taking these precautions, but still somehow the other, uh, these are the, these asymptomatic carriers are the most common cause of spread of the disease. So that is why uh, the incidence is rising, not just uh, in this area, but everywhere. So let's pray for the best and let's uh, hope that this passes off quickly. So today, uh, let's start with the next topic. And uh, uh, this is not in continuity with the antibiotics or the antibiotic resistance we studied, but this is one of the mechanisms uh, which is going to result in a change in the bacteria. And one of the changes could be the uh, resistance to antibiotics. So today, we are going to address the uh, topic of bacterial genetics. When uh, we, you must have read about genetics a little bit in your first and second years and you were given the basic concept of uh, the genes, you know that they are the blueprint for our body in whatever, however we look, however, whatever the traits we have, they are the cause of the um, characteristics which are present in our genes. So whatever is in our genes is going to decide the personality traits, the appearance, everything which we are going to have in our cells. So the genotype is going to determine the phenotype. And although parents, sons and daughters, they do not resemble each other except for twins, but they have certain characteristics which make them a part of a certain family. Similarly, when we talk about bacteria, we also know that the bacteria follow the law of genetics similar to us. So whatever the genes carry, information, that information is going to be transferred to their uh, offsprings as well. So, that is data. Ma'am, the voice is very faint. I mean, that is uh, a problem because of the internet. Uh, I'll just ask the attendant if he can do something about it. But 
if you don't understand anything, let me know. I'm going to repeat it so that your streaming ka, delay ka factor hai, that can be overcome. So basically, genetics is as important for us as it is for the bacteria. Just to give you a brief recap of what you already know, genetics is the study of heredity and the variations which it produces in the individuals. The unit is a gene, which is a segment of DNA, and that segment of DNA is going to specify a particular polypeptide. Polypeptides, as you know, they are chains of amino acids, and they are going to determine the proteins which are in turn going to be produced from them. Each gene has two portions, an exon and an intron, Intron are the non-coding sequences, whereas the exons, they are the coding sequences. And these are going to be responsible for the gene products and uh, ultimately the polypeptide chains, which, is, which are going to be produced. Discovery was by Watson and Crick of whatever we know about the DNA that started from these two individuals. And they told us that the uh, DNA is a double-stranded uh, helical uh, uh, structure which is made up of two polypeptide chains. And these polypeptide chains, they have a backbone of phosphate and sugars. And then they have the nucleosides, which could be adenine, thiamine, cytosine, or, or guanine. And they always, the purines and the pyrimidines, purines are the adenine, the, uh, the guanine, whereas the pyrimidines are the cytosine, the thiamine, and the purines are always going to pair up with the pyrimidines. And in this way, we have different pairs which are going to determine the type of amino acid which is going to be produced. So this, uh, the um, sugars, they are going to alternate with the phosphates to produce this backbone and to each, to each of which you have a purine or a pyrimidine base attached. So DNA and RNA basically they are similar to each other except that the sugar is ribose instead of deoxyribose. And instead of thymine, we have uracil in the RNA. And different types of RNA messenger transfer and ribosomal and all of them, they are going to play a part in the replication of the DNA. Then the genetic information in the bacteria is carried by three different mechanisms. Number one is the chromosome, which is the part, integral part of the bacterial anatomy. And this is going to carry genes which are going to code for the virulence, pathogenicity, how, pathogen, how pathogenic an organism is, and also for the resistance to various factors, to the UV light, to the antibiotics, to the, to the uh, uh, environmental stress factors. All of these uh, resistance factors are going to be carried up by the chromosome. Then we have the plasmids. These, as we so last time, our extra chromosomal genetic material present in the cytoplasm, they do not have any connection with the original chromosome. They can replicate independently. And then we have the bacteriophages, which are the viruses infecting the bacteria. And whatever genetic information is present within the bacteriophage, that can go into the bacteria as well. So these are three basic mechanisms by means of which the bacteria exchanges its genetic material between the bacteria or amongst itself. It can change its material with the help of the um, plasmate or the bacteriophage within the bacteria or the transposons. And then it can also change its uh, information between one bacteria to the other. But you complain that it's streaming new. But you complain that it's streaming what's glory. So next is the genetic code, and this indicates the type of nucleotides which are present, and three of the nucleotides they are going to constitute the codon or a triplet. This is the first letter, this is the second letter, and this is the third letter. So these are the nucleotides, and the combinations of these are going to result in a particular amino acid. For example, if three U's get together, then we have the uh, uh, phenylalanine, leucine, UUA, UUG, and there are other combinations 
least a combination of 64 photons which are going to be possible. And when they are going to, you can imagine when they are going to be stringed up in different ways, we can have so many polypeptide chains, so many different amino acid sequences. And then these are the three codons which if are going to be present in any gene, they are going to put a stop to the synthesis of the polypeptide. So UAA, UAG, and UGA is going to stop the, synth uh, synth uh, the polypeptide synthesis or that process. And therefore, the uh, if it occurs early, then the polypeptide synthesis would be uh, not proper. It would not be the actual uh, polypeptide, which is going to give rise to a proper amino acid uh, sequence. So what are the mechanisms of genetic variation? The bacteria can utilize different mechanisms for the transfer or exchange of genetic material. And these are transformation, transduction, conjugation, mesogenic conver conversion, or transposition. And basically, this is going to cause, the, basically, initially, there is a change in the genetic information. And then it can be transferred to another bacteria or within the same bacterial cell. So mutation is basically, it's a random variation in which a base sequence is being replaced by another base sequence. It can be inherited from the, from the uh, parents or it can occur spontaneously in a, any generation. So types of mutations could be a base substitution or a point mutation. It could be a frame shift mutation or it could be a transposon or insertion sequence integration into the DNA. All of these are going to result in a mutation which is going to change the sequence of the polypeptide which is being produced. So what is the base mutation or a point mutation? There are three types. What is happening is that instead of the original base, that base is substituted by a different one. So here is the original DNA. Over here, we have the cytosine and in the Mutant DNA, instead of this C remaining there during the replication process, due to any factor, it could be an environmental stress factor, it could be UV radiation, it could be a chemical, anything can induce that mutation. This cytosine is replaced by thymine. And if this thymine is going to be present over here, when the messenger RNA is going to read this frame, this line, it is going to have a complement to the thymine, not to the cytosine. So over here, if it was the original DNA, the cytosine would have a complement of which one? Adenine combines with what? Cytosine or thymine? Adenine. Adenine. Thymine. 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 Adenine, it combines with thymine and cytosine combines with guanine. And so therefore, here there is a gene. So thymine is combining with the adenine. So over here, instead of the original amino acid, you get a polypeptide chain with a wrong amino acid. So now this polypeptide chain will not code for the protein which it originally wanted to, but there will be a chain. Now, this could be a silent mutation. A silent mutation is one in which this change in the protein does not result, a uh, change in the amino acid does not result in a change in the end product. So over here, the individual would not be uh, uh, even aware or the bacterial uh, mutation will not be aware of the change in the protein synthesis. So this is called a silent mutation when it is not going to change the end product then there is a missense mutation. Missense mutation is going to produce a different amino acid than the particular one over here as it is shown in this picture. And this could have an effect on the end product and this is known as a missense mutation. The second thing happens is that adenine combines with the uracil. Over here, C is replaced with adenine and the adenine combines with the uracil. Now the code which it forms is UAA. And the UAA, is, as I told you, is a stop codon. Now, this will stop the reading of the messenger RNA beyond this point. And there will be premature stoppage of the polypeptide synthesis. 
Consequently, the amino acids required for the synthesis of the protein product will not be complete. And here, therefore, the product will be useless for that individual. And that will result in a deficiency of that particular protein in that individual. And therefore, this is known as a nonsense mutation because it is having a direct um, effect on the product. Over here, in this sense, it is also having a direct effect on the product, but the product is being synthesized, although the product may not be similar to the original one. And the silent is that the product is not changed. So this is a base mutation or a point mutation. Clear? Is this concept clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, ma so this is just to give you an English example for explaining the difference between missense and nonsense. The boy and the dog ran far. This you can consider it as a single codon, three, three letter words depicting a codon. And over here, the D is replaced by an H. So although the sequence remains the same, the sentence also makes a sense. The boy and the hog ran far, but it is not the same as the original. So this is a missense mutation. Over here, and is the stop codon. So there is no further formation of the sentence. So this becomes a nonsense mutation. Clear? Yes, ma'am. So then number two is the frame shift mutation. Frame shift mutations occur due either bay is an additional base added to that uh, frame or one is taken out from the frame. So again, numerous factors which could cause this. But basically, if you have the original triple A, ATA, CGT, and GCA, you get a T inserted into it. The messenger RNA is going to read this mutated DNA and will produce a mutated messenger RNA, which is then going to code for a different amino acid sequence. Okay? Similarly, you can have a deletion occurring in the mutated DNA strand. When it is deleted over here, if you see this was triple A, then it was ATA. Over here, you get a T removed. Therefore, the complement which is going to be produced will have a different sequence as compared to the original one. Again, this is going to result in a change of the framework which is being read beyond this point. And the amino acid sequence beyond this point would be different. And the, therefore, the consequently, the uh, protein produced would also be different. So this is a frame shift mutation when you are shifting the whole frame, either one plus or one minus. The same example, the boy and the dog ran far. Over here, we are deleting the N. And when the N is deleted, the whole frame is going to shift and you will have the sentence, the boy, ADT, HED, OGR, ANF, AR, which does not make any sense. So this is a result of a deletion which has resulted in a mutation. And therefore, up till this point, before the deletion, you have a sequence which is correct. And beyond that, you have a sequence which is incorrect. Similarly, if we add something to it, again, the frame is going to shift, or shift towards the right side. Over here, this is the original E. And between this, H and E, we have inserted another uh, base. This again remains the same, but the rest of the sequence is shifted and it does not make any sense. So this is an example of a frame shift mutation. Clear? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma Third way in which you can get you know, the uh, change is through a insertion of either a transposon or an insertion sequence into the DNA. This is going to produce changes in the gene in which they are inserted, as well as they are going to produce uh, uh, not only new changes in uh, new changes because they are inserting the new genes in them, they are also going to produce changes in the site of insertion as well. The genes which are on the side of the insertion, they are also going to be changed and therefore they can alter the gene activity or they can totally destroy the gene activity. The same sequence can happen in the bacteria, resulting in different types of uh, uh, damage to the genes, uh, to the traits of that bacteria. 
in individuals in humans we can result this can result in hemophilia a or b it can result in duchenne muscular dystrophy another disease and a few others this is just to give you an example that these insertion sequences or the transposons they can have very harmful effects when they get inserted into the uh, normal chromosome then what are the reasons why these mutations take place in the bacteria they can be chemical mutations they can be viruses it could be because of a uh, uh, certain um, x rays radiation etc so chemical mutations could either be uh, a change from one type of uh, uh, nucleotide base to another for example nitrous acid it converts the adenine to a form that does not bind with thymine but it binds to cytosine so therefore this would be a change which is going to result in a mutation then they could be nucleoside analogs analogs are structures analogs are substances which are similar to another substance so we have five bromouracil which is similar to the thymine and this thymine is going to then bind with the guanine the thymine normally is going to bind with the guanine to produce a particular and uh, amino acid but with the presence of five bromouracil this is going to bind with the guanine and since this does not have the characteristics of thymine so we will not have the particular amino acid which we are looking for then similarly benzpyrene this is present in smoke and soot and this can cause a fame shift mutation either by the deletion of a base or by addition of a base so these are examples of chemical mutations uh, 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 mutagens and mutations caused by these chemicals then we have radiation radiations could be either in the form of x rays or ultraviolet radiation x rays have a higher energy so they damage the dna in uh, more ways than the ultraviolet radiation they can break the covalent bonds that hold the ribose and the phosphate chain together this is going to dismantle the uh, backbone then they can produce free radicals which can attack the nucleotide bases causing their destruction or they can cause the change in the electrons in the bases and therefore the hydrogen bonding of these bases would not be as strong and this will again rip the uh, center of the dna molecule then we have the ultraviolet radiation which is having a lower energy but it causes the formation of dimers the pyrimidines and the uh, the adjacent pyrimidines they can get cross linked with the because of the uh, ultraviolet radiation and when they cross link with each other they are going to form dimers and this does not uh, uh, allow the dna to replicate properly so basically what is happening is that uh, dimers are going to be formed between the adenine and the cytosine or between the thymine and the guanine and when these are going to be stuck together then they will not separate and they will not or they will form the dimers between these two bases so they will not uh, be separatable easily and they will not cause the uh, dna replication properly then we have certain viruses which can act as a mutation factors for example mutator or new bacteriophage and bacteriophage viruses which can infect the bacteria and if they have a mutation they can inject that dna into the uh, bacteria and produce a fame shift mutation and most of the commonly it produces a deletion and they cause a high frequency of mutations when the dna is inserted into the bacterial chromosome and because the insertion can be at various sites therefore mutation can occur at various sites in the gene as well so these produce a lot of different types of mutations in the bacteria then there is a term which is known as conditioned conditional lethal mutations these are of medical importance because they allow us to utilize this capacity of mutation producing in the bacteria and then using these bacteria for our own benefit for example for the production of vaccines because if we give a live bacteria to an individual it is going to produce the disease in that individual which may be as harmful as when he acquires it naturally but when we produce a conditional lethal mutation what we are doing is that we are 
be producing a mutation which will allow that uh, uh, virus or uh, sorry which will allow that bacteria to multiply or express its genes under a particular condition only most importantly in this respect are the temperate temperature sensitive uh, uh, mutations temperature sensitive mutations are going to allow the organism to multiply in a particular temperature only for example it will have a permissive temperature of 32 but not 37 which means that it cannot multiply at the body temperature but it will multiply at a temperature which is at a, a 32 degree centigrade in any area in the body which has a temperature which is lower than 37 it will be able to replicate and once it is able to replicate uh, in that environment it will induce the immune response to uh, elicit the formation of antibodies and this mutation basically is achieved by a change in the amino acid sequence example of this is a uh, influenza virus vaccine which is being currently used as uh, an experimental vaccine what they are trying to do is they are trying to produce a virus which is temperature sensitive so that it can grow at 37 degrees centigrade therefore it sorry it cannot grow at 37 degrees centigrade and therefore it will not be able to infect the lungs and the uh, structures uh, of the lungs because the temperature there is at 37 degrees centigrade so it cannot infect the lungs it cannot produce pneumonia however it will be able to grow in the nose where the general temperature is 32 degrees centigrade there it will replicate and it will induce a local immunity and that immunity will then allow that individual to be safe from the influenza strain because these are airborne infections clear yes ma'am yes ma'am plasmids uh, have, we've been repeatedly talking about them they are small molecules of dna that replicate independently they carry not information only for their own self but they can also carry information which is going to allow the Uh, 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 the uh, itself to survive as well as it can, can can send these genes to the bacteria itself, bacterial chromosome itself, and allow its uh, survival advantages as well. We have different types of plasmids which are uh, operative, like the fertility factor or the F plasmid, then resistance factor or the R plasmid, which code for the antibiotic resistances. then the bacterial send factors which are certain uh, enzymes produced by the bacteria which are able to kill other bacteria then there are the virulence plasmids which are going to give a certain virulence characteristics to the bacteria which will allow it to survive different environmental conditions then there are the cryptic plasmids which are going to allow the bacteria to survive certain other um, environmental conditions which are temperature sensitive then we have the transfer of dna how does the actual transfer of dna take place it can be the transfer of dna between the bacteria within the bacterial cell or between the bacterial cell within the bacterial cell means that it is within the bacteria one bacteria only that is the original bacteria and this is between two cells one becomes the donor and the other becomes the recipient what is the importance of this genetic uh, of this uh, genetic uh, exchange of material it is allowing the bacteria to gain antibiotic resistance the antibiotic resistant genes can move from one bacteria which has the gene to another bacteria which does not have the antibiotic resistance so in this way it is going to transfer the antibiotic resistance to that bacteria as well when that starts multiplying it will produce a whole a large population which is going to be responsible for the resistance to a particular antibiotic similarly the virulence genes can move between bacteria and then they can also allow certain genes to change the antigenic makeup of a bacterium and once the antigen of a bacterium changes the body is not able to recognize that as the, the previous one and therefore even if it mounts an immune response it will be able able to not recognize that antigen example of this is that the uh, we we'll take the example of influenza uh, virus we have uh, commonly experienced influenza or flu in our lifetime more than once why because once 
when we, when we say that once if we have a viral or a bacterial infection, it induces the formation of antibodies, which are supposed to be protective for us, and we should not have a second bout of the same infection. With influenza, what happens is that, and especially if we are going to have even taken a vaccine, we should be doubly protected by it. But what happens is that the influenza keeps on changing its outer structure. All the antigens which are present on its outer surface, the virus keeps on changing. So whenever we have an initial infection, the antibodies produced against that may not be the same against the second bout of influenza virus which we have. So since the virus changes its antigen, the body is not able to identify it as the original one and therefore it has to again make the antibodies against a particular second type of virus which again takes some time. So we are not protected by the vaccine or by the initial infection which we have. It provides, the vaccine is going to provide some immunity but not to the same extent as, uh, as if the antigenic makeup would have been identical to the original one. Uh, also, these uh, uh, genetic mutations make it uh, susceptible to the bacteriophages to a certain extent. Then they can also affect the colonial production or the multiplication of the bacteria. They will also alter certain factors like the production of the capsula, production of the flagella, production of certain other uh, enzymes. And all of these, they are the, uh, the result of the genetic mutations which are occurring in these bacteria over a period of time. Now, how does the transfer of DNA occur between the, uh, bit, uh, sorry, within this bacterial cell? Within the bacterial cells, it can occur in the same uh, DNA or it can occur into a different part of the DNA. What do I mean is that this is the bacterial chromosome or this is a part of the plasmid which is present within the chromosome. The transposon which is in within this uh, DNA material, that gets excised and it just jumps to another portion of that same chromosome or plasmid but at a different site. And because the excision is not going to be very uh, clear or it is not going to be say identical, it will carry certain genes from this portion into the new area and when they combine together, they are going to give it certain newer characteristics. Then the second mechanism is the transfer of the DNA uh, from the plasmid to the chromosome or from the chromosome to the plasmid. So over here, we have the transposon, which is, multi which is replicated and the, the, this is then going to produce the transposase enzyme. This enzyme is going to produce a cut in the target DNA, but this cut is not going to be at identical places. It's going to be at two different places in the target cell. And once this cut has taken place, then these transposons, which have been cut from the original DNA material, they are going to get attached to it. But you see these terminal repeats over here, which are part of the original DNA, they are also being attached and they are also coming along with this transposome. This gets inserted along with these into the sequence of DNA which was cut. And then this is going to regrow these uh, sequences to produce a bonding between the transposome and the original DNA. Over here, it will go from this side. And ultimately, we have a gap filled with the transposome as well as the duplicating sequences which were present in the original DNA. So whatever genes it brought along, whatever characteristics it brought along, it is going to be transferred to either the plasmid or to the chromosome. Is this mechanism of transposition clear? How these genes are going to be transferred one in one bacterial cell? Yes, ma'am. Okay. So the second method by means of which the bacteria transfer the DNA within their own cells is through a programmed rearrangement. Now, what happens is that this is a gene and it has different uh, loci and some of them, they are going to be silent. Some of them are going to express themselves. What, the, what is meant by expression? Expression is that they are able to replicate themselves. So the messenger RNA would be produced and it will result in the formation of a protein and ultimately the formation of a particular antigen. 
Over here, we have a silent locus. It is not producing any messenger RNA. But sometimes this bacteria is going to rearrange this whole uh, loci and it is going to move this silent zone into a zone which is expressive zone. So once it moves to a place where the locus is going to be expressed, then it is going to be uh, read by the messenger RNA and result in the formation of a protein. But now this protein would not be the same as the protein one. It would be the one which is going to be which is going to be coded by the locus two. So this will be different from the protein one. So over here we have a protein two and consequently an antigen two. This is how the organisms they are going to change the antigens which are present on their surface. I've given you two examples, Neisseria and Borrelia, which commonly do this. And once if they have an antigen one and after some multiplications or re reproduction, they develop an antigen 2, then this would be entirely different from the original bacterium. This will have no recognition by the body, even, and this can always, this can also occur while the organism is producing an infection in an individual. It's not necessary that it is occurring in the outside environment. During an infection, it can also undergo these antigen changes so that the antibiotic which was effective against this type of uh, organism then becomes ineffective against this type of organism and that is why antibiotic resistance develops during an infection as well. Clear? Understood? Yes ma'am. Any questions regarding how the bacteria move their DNA within the same bacterial cell? Okay, let's move on. Uh, repeat uh, this with uh, the transfer within the bacterial cell. Bacterial cell. Do no cheese repeat for Uh, nay, ma'am, this ye wala within the bacterial cell. Ye, yeah. ye jo, this slide. Just this slide. Okay. We have this gene which has different uh, areas, and some of them are expressive and some of them are silent. By expressive, we mean that this locus is going to be a, be a uh, is going to produce certain enzymes or certain uh, factors which are going to cause the messenger RNA to read this area. This is a silent one. It does not produce any such uh, trigger which is going to cause the messenger RNA to come to this area and read this region. So, if this is being read, it is producing this type of protein in an antigen. The bacteria wants to now change its antigens. What it does is that it causes a rearrangement of this whole area. This one gets shifted to some other place. And in this expression area, this gene moves towards this point. And once this gene moves towards this point, then it can be read by the messenger RNA. As a consequence, we have a different type of antigen. So this organism had to antigen one, this organism has antigen two. So there are two different antigens which are going to produce different immune responses in the body. If the body had already produced a response against antigen 1 or if the antibiotic was effective against this antigen, it is now no longer going to be effective against the second one. Yeah? Yes, yes ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Any questions? Yes, thank you. So now we have the transfer of DNA between the bacterial cells. This is between a donor. One bacterium is called a donor. The other is called a recipient. And they can become, uh, uh, the DNA can become integrated by the process of transformation, transduction, or conjugation. These are three different mechanisms. First of all, let's see what is transformation. Transformation, when we have a dead, degraded bacterium and its DNA, and we have a live, competent, bacterium which has its own DNA and when there is an exchange of genetic material from the dead into the live one we have the process of transformation it is four steps what is happening is that initially this is the bacterium it undergoes certain environmental changes it dies off once it dies off it disintegrates and its DNA also disintegrates into smaller pieces if this disintegrated DNA comes into contact with a live recipient bacterium, 
because now this is receiving the bacteria. So we are receiving the DNA, we are calling it a recipient pathway. If this comes across the DNA and it has a DNA binding receptor as well, this DNA fragment gets attached to that receptor and it becomes internalized. Once it is internalized, then there are certain genes in the bacteria like the REC A gene. And this is going to promote the insertion of this donor DNA into the recipient's DNA. Once this gets attached into it, now this is going to be a newer uh, DNA material as compared to the original one. And now it is going to carry all the genes and all the characteristics which were present in the genes in this DNA of the dead bacterium. So transfer of DNA material from a dead to a live bacterium is the process of transformation. Clear? Yes, ma'am. This is the simplest form of transfer of DNA material between two bacteria. And this was proved by an experiment which is known as the Griffiths experiment. And uh, uh, it was seen that uh, we had, they, they, they were carrying out a experiment in which there was a bacterial strain pneumococcus which is capsulated. And this capsulated uh, pneumococcus, when it was injected into a mouse, the mouse died. Then they took another type of uh, pneumococcus, which was uh, uh, rough. That means it did not have a capsule. Capsule is a virulence factor, as you've already studied. Over here, it is devoid of the capsule. So when this was injected into it, the mouse remained healthy. Then the third experiment which they did was they took this capsulated bacterial strain, then they killed it with heat, and then they injected this suspension into the mouse. The mouse again remained healthy. That meant that the heat destroyed the virulence factor of that bacteria. Then what they did was that they mixed this solution, which had heat killed cells, plus the living R cells, sorry, this one, living cells. So over here, we have the factor the virulence factor, but it is not affected. And here we have the living cells, which do not have the virulence factor. They mix the two together. And when they injected this mixture, they found that the mouse died. And what they saw from when they took a sample from here is that the, now the mouse had died because the pneumococcus was capsulated. Although they had given it a non-capsulated form, so that meant that the factors which were killed with the heat, they were still present around the bacteria and they were transferred. This gene which had, which was coding for the capsule, that was transferred to this live uh, bacterium, which initially did not have the virulence factor and now it acquired the virulence factor through the process of transformation and it was able to kill the mouse. So this was the, uh, the experiment which was uh, uh, showing the transformation of uh, the process of transformation or the exchange between a dead and a living bacterial cell. Clear? Then we have the second process, which is transduction. Transduction is, in, is the process through uh, which we are transferring the DNA segment from one bacterium to another by the help of a bacteriophage. And this is the bacteriophage. It has a head, it has a tail, it has a base plate by means of which it gets attached to the surface of the bacterium and then it has a contractile sheath and this contractile sheath when it goes up it is going to be the mechanism which is going to inject the it produces the force which is going to inject the DNA of the uh, bacteriophage into the bacteria cell. Here now there are two different types of bacteriophages. One is known as the lytic or the virulent bacteriophage. A lytic or a virulent bacteriophage is always going to cause the lysis of the bacterial cell. Whatever the process it undergoes, ultimately the bacterial cell is going to die and it is going to release more uh, viruses, bacteriophages of the type which was uh, in, uh, infecting it. So here we have a virus particle. This is its DNA. Number one step is the attachment or absorption to the host cell with the help of the base plate. Then we have the protein coat, which is going to be uh, stripped off. It is going to remain outside because it is going to inject the DNA material only into the uh, 
uh, into the bacteria itself. Once through penetration, the DNA, viral DNA enters, it is going to utilize the machinery of the bacterial cell to synthesize its protein uh, codes as well as the DNA material. Once this is produced, it's going to then package it, and then this packaging is going to be released by the lysosome cell. So whatever DNA was present in this is now going to be transferred to this uh, uh, progeny. At times, when it is multiplying, it is going to take up some bacterial DNA as well. How it does that? Let's see. Before that, let's see what uh, is the difference between a lytic and a temperate part. A temperate bacteriophage can multiply either through the lytic cycle or it can multiply or, or it cannot multiply and go into a quiet stage. And this is important because the uh, bacteria is going to cause the respiration or it is going to cause the phage genes to remain in a quiet stage without being expressed at a particular time. So this allows the virus to remain in a dormant stage for a particular uh, for a particular time. And then when it finds the environmental factors uh, uh, are not good, then at that time, it starts expressing these uh, genes. And the process is known as lysogeny. And with the, the part which gets integrated into the bacterial chromosome, that is now known as the prophage. The DNA portion is now known as the prophage. What does a temperate bacteriophage do? A temperate bacteriophage can go into a lytic pathway or it can go into a lysogenic pathway. It all depends upon the environmental conditions which it is being exposed to. So the viral particle gets absorbed or attached and then it injects its DNA into it. And this is the DNA of the bacteria. If it is going to go into the lytic pathway because the environment conditions are such that it has to, uh, it cannot survive, then it is going to just utilize the machinery of that host cell to multiply and it is going to go into the lytic phase. But most of the situations, it can lie in a dormant stage and then it goes into a lysogenic path. The lysogenic pathway is the pathway in which it is going to integrate its DNA into the DNA of the host. This occurs through the uh, cleavage of the DNA of the host and then insertion. And different enzymes are required for this process. Now, this inserted DNA is now known as the viral DNA is now known as the prophage. And the cell is known as a lysogenized cell and the process is known as lysogeny. This can then divide and once it is dividing, it can uh, carry this information as well into the daughter cells. So now we have the characteristics of the original bacterium along with the characteristics of the viral DNA incorporated into this bacteria and its progeny. And therefore, all the characteristics which are present, the genes which are present in this viral DNA and the things which they are going to code for, they will become the characteristics of this cell. Induction of this lysogenic phase into the lytic phase can also occur. The trigger could be environmental stress, trigger could be in, uh, some chemical, it could be ultraviolet radiation, it could be some other sort of radiation, anything which is going to harm the bacteria that is going to induce the formation of the uh, lytic pathway or the, this lytic cycle so that number of viral particles carrying these, uh, this uh, information, they can be produced. Then the third process, or rather the second process of transduction is of two types, generalized transduction or the specialized transduction. Generalized transduction is the DNA fragment is transferred from one bacterium to another with the help of a bacterio, uh, bacteriophage, a lytic bacteriophage. Generalized is with the help of a temperate bacteriophage. What happens in this case? We have a lytic bacteriophage. This is the, uh, it gets uh, adsorbed to a bacterium, injects its viral DNA into it. And this is now going to start asking this bacterial cell's machinery to make its components. 
which starts making the capsid, it starts making different types of components as well as the viral DNA. It's going to start replicating and then it is going to start assembling itself into the form of a bacterial part. But sometimes what happens is that the bacterial DNA also gets incorporated into the uh, into this uh, bacterial part. Over here, it is the original viral genome which is being uh, enclosed in the capsule. But at times, it is also going to cause the disintegration of the bacterial DNA, and some of the bacterial DNA will get entrapped in the viral capsule. And when the cell undergoes the lysis, we have these three which are original, and this is wearing the bacterial DNA. And again, when we repeat this cycle, the bacteriophage, which carries the bacterial DNA, injects the DNA into the, uh, into the uh, recipient bacteria. And once it goes there, it can then become a part of the recipient's bacteria. And now it is carrying the characteristics of the original one as well. This was the original bacteria and the bacterial nucleotide. Now, that characteristic has been transferred into another bacterium. Now it will, when it multiplies, it is going to be in, the, in addition to this information, it is also going to pass this information to the daughter cells. So this is how the lytic bacteriophage is going to transfer it to the next generation or the another bacterium. And this is known as trans, uh, generalized transduction. Then we have specialized transduction in which the temperate bacterial phage is going to be responsible for the exchange. This is the phage genome gets integrated to the bacterium's DNA, and this is now known as the prophage. It becomes a part of the bacterial nucleotide, uh, nu uh, nucleic material. Occasionally, there is a spontaneous induction. Spontaneous induction, as I've been talking about, ultraviolet radiation, chemical stress, any out, any stress on that bacterium, which will cause it to start uh, breaking up, and this is going to also cause the breakage of the DNA material. One piece of the phage DNA, along with a smaller portion of the bacterial DNA, also gets broken off from the original nucleic nucleic uh, acid material. And over here, when the bacteriophage starts synthesizing its own uh, components, the material which is now within the head of the bacteriophage is a combination of the phage DNA as well as a small portion of the bacterial DNA. This undergoes the lytic cycle. This gets in injected into a second bacterium, and this will now have on, uh, the components of both the bacterial DNA as well as the phage DNA. But over here, you are having more of the phage DNA as compared to the donor DNA. And this occurs randomly. And since only a small portion of the, of the bacterial DNA gets the transfer of its genes to the recipient DNA, this is known as specialized transduction. This plays an important role. Sorry, the spelling of role is wrong. This plays an important role in the transfer of antibiotic resistance and pathogenicity factors. Generalized transduction transfers more new genes to the bacteria as compared to the specialized transduction because the uh, cutting off of the plasmid, not the plasmid, the phage, as well as the bacterial DNA, that is limited. Over here, you are just getting a portion of the phage DNA and then a portion of the bacterial DNA. So the whole phage is not coming, the whole the DNA sequence is not coming. So we have a limited amount of genes which can be transferred. And therefore, uh, this is going to transfer lesser newer characteristics to the bacteria as compared to the generalized transcription. Then the last is the conjugation. And it is a transfer of DNA from a living bacterium to another living bacterium. And this is with the help of a sex virus. There are three processes, L plus conjugation, HFR conjugation, and the resistance plasmid conjugation, which is the most important, is the resistance one. F plasmid is a fertility plasmid, and this ensures that the organism is able to mate with another bacterial cell. 
the plasmid has genes which are going to code for the formation of a conjugation virus and it attaches one bacterial cell to another. And once this attachment takes place, the two cells, they become linked to each other and they can be drawn together and they can become attached to each other. This is which has the F plasmid that is known as the F positive cell and which does not, it is known as the F negative cell. So the F positive cell gets attached to the F negative cell. The plasmid replicates, it, uh, it gets uh, cleaved by an enzyme and it's two strands out of these, one is going into the F negative cell and the other one remains behind. And then they replicate to produce the double stranded plasmid, uh, plasmid uh, structure. And these cells, which are going to now have the F plus uh, F uh, or the fertility genes, they are known as the F positive cells. Started with a, F, a single F positive cell and we've ended with a double F positive cell. Now, both these cells, they are going to carry the fertility uh, uh, gene and both of them will be able to mate with other F negative cells. Clear? Then we have the HFR conjugation or the higher frequency recombination conjugation. What happens in this? Again, this is a cell in which we have the plasmid which carries the F positive factor. And then we have a process in which the F plasmid gets inserted into the bacterial DNA. And then the bacterial DNA replicates. With the help of the same process, the sex pilus, it attaches to a, another bacterial cell, which is F negative. The two come into close contact with each other. Over there, we had just the, in the F positive conjugation, we just had the fertility plasmid being transferred to the recipient bacteria. Over here, now we are having the whole bacterium uh, chromosome as well as the plasmid, F plasmid being transferred. But the whole chromosome does not get uh, transferred because this process does not uh, last long. And after some time, the cells, they start separating from each other. When this starts occurring, the strand is going to break off and only that material which had passed into the recipient, that is going to be transferred to the recipient a cell. This rejoins and it forms the whole again. And this DNA material, which carries some of the genes from the plasmid and some of the genes from the donor, they get incorporated into the recipient's DNA material. So now we have this characteristics and then we have the characteristics of uh, this new cell. And the new cell is now known as the high frequency recombinant cell. The uh, genetic exchange occurs and only uh, a small amount of the F uh, positive is transferred. The whole is not transferred, so this is not an F positive cell. It, rem it remains an F negative cell. But the cell has a larger number of uh, different types of genes being transferred, so therefore it is known as a high frequency recombinant cell. And the third is the plasmid or the resistance plasmid conjugation. Over here, we have a bacterium in which the plasmid is now instead of the fertility, we have the resistance plasmid. It is carrying resistance to either one or more than one antibody. And this is the bacterium cell. The same process of the sex virus formation, the splitting up of the R plasmid into uh, duplication and then cleavage and then the transfer of the R plasmid, the whole of the R plasmid into the recipient cell. And once it has it is there, then the two cells separate and they are going to then duplicate. And now you have an R plasmid in both the cells, which are going to uh, to code uh, for the multiple antibiotic resistance in now both of these cells. Initially, we had just this cell. Now we have two cells and they can also transfer it to other bacteria. In this way, the population not only by Reproduction is increasing of the antibiotic resistance bacteria, but it is also being transferred to other bacterial cells which are not already antibiotic resistant. Recombination uh, can be of two types. It could be homologous or it could be non-homologous. Homologous is when the two pieces of DNA which have lined up, they are very, very similar to each other. They are either, either identical or they have majority of their regions which are similar to each other. And the non-homologous recombination is that in which there is very little homology 
and these are the two different types of the combinations which are identified. Any questions? Anything which you would like to ask? No questions? No, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Excuse me. 